Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide. It's a phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 4, Episode 8, titled Like a Hurricane. You know, I'm really disappointed in Miami Vice that there wasn't a hurricane-related show title until now. <laughs> also had nothing to do with like, a mm-hmm. hurricane. Yeah, that, I understand. <laughs> that, that's, that's a different topic. <laughs> <laughs> For a state that's everything else is named after hurricanes, including the U right there in Miami. Such a letdown that there isn't more hurricane-named stuff in Miami Vice. Or any episodes where there's a hurricane. Yeah, damn it, Miami Vice. Very true. (laughs) It's always sunny. No hurricanes. Whether they ever get is that it's really hot. Yeah, humid. This episode premiered on November 20th, 1987. It is written by Robert Palm, who wrote a bunch of teleplays. This is the only episode he actually wrote from beginning to end. He writes a bunch of other teleplays and will be the story editor for the last 13 episodes of this season. So his impact will be felt more throughout this season. Hmm. Do you take that as you will? Hmm. <laughs> I know how to take that. So <laughs> <laughs> It is directed by Colin Buxy, who also directed Death and the Lady. So he's the guy in the porn. <laughs> We found him. We called him out. <laughs> He's got two more episodes coming. So there's, we're not done with Colin Buxy. Before we get started, I can check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. Guys, we are just a mere one week away from the premiere of Ready Player One. And now it's been some debate online about this movie. And for those who are not aware, Ready Player One is based on a book that is basically a recap of Everyone's childhood dreams of the 80s, all summed up into a single book. Video games, movies, TV shows, you name it. It's pop culture that happened in the 80s. It's in that book, Ready Player One. Now they're tweaking it a little bit because they can't get the rights for everything that was in the book. And it's Steven Spielberg that's making the movie. So it's going to be more Spielberg stuff in it where there was more anime that was in the book. So, but it's also, I would imagine that they would have to spend more time explaining these kind of things to millennials, you know, (laughs) uh, all the fun stuff about cassette tapes and uh, VHS. (laughs) One of the best parts, too, in the book, in the story, so as I'm sure it'll make it into the movie, is all the video game stuff. And they play lots and lots of references to, like, original Atari and PC games and then arcade cabinets. Not like Nintendo stuff, but more like classic cabinets that you'd have to go to the pizza parlor to go play yeah. or something like that. They also re- have to recreate the entire movie of War Games. So <laughs> that's how deep into the 80s it is. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I am super, super pumped for this movie. And I have been accosting everyone I see on the street and asking them if they've read Ready have Player read One Are you in going? preparation for the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I can attest to that. He has. <laughs> And I am the other thing that I've noticed with this movie is that people are already starting to hate on it. And it's gotten me to the point now. It's like, you know, what? I don't care. I'm not watching reviews. I'm not watching trailers. I'm not reading headlines. I'm done with Rotten Tomatoes. Like, I'm just out. Like, everyone, this is supposed to be the era in which people are allowed to nerd out over things that they want to without judgment. It seems like it's the exact opposite now. You know, and, and welcome to sci-fi fandom. I don't know how many times with sci-fi movies or like superhero movies, like I can't, I hear immediately as it comes out, oh, this is bad or it's terrible and stuff. And I still end up enjoying the movie being a fan of comic books. So I've learned to just disregard all the stuff I hear, no matter what movie it is, no matter what reviews that they're getting. Exactly. I, And I'm starting to see more into what people have been saying about Rotten Tomatoes and those types of review sites that they are ruining movies because they're trying to get the break on reviews. We know it's the exact opposite of sci-fi. This episode of Miami Vice, because I think this turned the show into a soap opera. Yes. It ends in a much different way than I expected. Yeah. From UFOs to soap operas. (laughs) Let's go talk about this episode. Okay, so in the opening, we open up at a new club, and there's a lot of clubs in Miami, and there's lots of different types of clubs. And this is what I refer to as the break-in club in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> the wardrobe was definitely breaking. Bicycle we get a nice shorts. introduction to uh, MCs of rap who will fall into our music. Uh, getting a little bit of love at the beginning of the Vice episode here. I do appreciate that 
the era of half shirts and suspenders. And shorts to go yeah, with they it. They need to bring that back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we open up at this club because Caitlin, who's played by Sheena Easton, and John has, I'm sure, plenty of information about her because she's also the guest star, a returning, recurring character guest star, and also recurring music. Oh, yeah. So we will talk about her at the end of the show in the music, so I won't spoil that. Let's just say Sheena Easton, she was famous. <laughs> she was a thing. <laughs> Kaylin is talking to Tommy, a man named Tommy, and she's trying to say, I, I'd like to get back to being famous again. And he says, I need some music from you. And then another guy named Benny comes up and he exchanges some money and keys to his car to get the blonde that's sitting next to Tommy a record deal and get her a top five hit that he's given up the money and, and the car for. And clearly she, th Tommy's a little bit of a hack, you know, and I got that feeling too. Uh, uh, just from his look, I was kind of thinking like, I bet you he records the music in his garage or in like his motel room or something. <laughs> and we find out later what it is. He's just dried up using up all of his smallest connections. He still has in the industry to try and get people in, but he's still got, Enough connections with people that he can make promises for hits. By the way, Tommy, played by Xander Berkeley, he also plays Officer Bailey in the episode Victim of Circumstance, which is kind of strange considering th those episodes aren't very far away from each other. He's most notably known for his roles as George Mason on 24, uh, Percy Rose on Nikita, and he currently plays Gregory on The Walking Dead, but he has over 200 acting credits from the 80s until now. He's made appearances in Terminator 2, Apollo 13, Gattaca, The Rock, but something more Vice-related is that he also appeared in both the 1989 TV movie L.A. Takedown and the 95 critically acclaimed remake of it, Heat, both directed by Michael Mann. He is in like some of the most classic TV shows, too. Like that list that, that you just read off. He's kind of a big deal for TV. Yeah, we didn't even know who he was. He al <laughs> <laughs> also did a lot of voice acting for cartoons. He was in like the Teen Titans cartoons, Gargoyles animated series. He did Mysterio in the Spectacular Spider-Man. Now, Gargoyles, I, I just want to highlight Gargoyles animated series because that also is going to pop up again, probably in music. <laughs> also, it was an amazing series. We still watch that. I watched that with the kids. We have that whole thing. <laughs> we watched it. <laughs> well, what's happening here with Caitlin is that she's talking to Tommy about getting the deal. He then does this behind the curtain deal with Benny. That way he can pay for sponsorship for her to get a hit. And then the U.S. attorneys come moving in and it turns out Caitlin was an undercover. She was being a whistleblower on Tommy. And then they come in and arrest her. I mean, Tommy and she doesn't even hide it. She's like, he, he says you. And she's like, yeah, I'm bringing you down. You're done for. Also, he makes a joke. He goes, oh, mm -hmm. do you want me to say that into the microphone for you? Like, it's a joke. And she's like, ha, 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 ha. Like, whatever. So <laughs> did he make a, was he making a joke about possibly being set up? And it just ended up being that way? Or? he just knew it? Yeah, he knew know. it already? I don't know. It's <laughs> very strange. Meanwhile, I don't know. But I was impressed by their sting. There was very little shooting. <laughs> I, I think they could t teach something to the vice squad. <laughs> Also, the U.S. attorneys have arresting officers. Yeah, they That's do. That's a thing. They have their own. No, you use like the local police or something. No, they have their own like law. <laughs> the IRS does screw around. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, at the precinct, Crockett has taped some people trying to buy rocket launchers and Uzis. But Castillo says ATF is covering that you're on babysitting duty. Basically. <laughs> How and for the best reason ever, because he looks like he'd fit in with music folk. <laughs> you got that fancy haircut. You wear those bright colors. Like, you'd fit in great with them. That's why you're on babysitting duty. This is another one of those episodes where you're constantly questioning, why is Vice involved with this? This is not a Vice thing at all. No. Like, halfway through the episode, Castillo's like, get out of there. You don't, we don't need you there anymore. <laughs> but he keeps going back. <laughs> I also like Crockett's attitude. He's uh, like, the his initial response to having to do babysitting duties he starts saying oh you know this pop star she's stuck up she's probably a bitch <laughs> little she's does he know weird. yeah little does he know how no, this is gonna end up yeah he's 
telling it's great because he's telling tubs like she's probably really weird because she's been famous for so long exactly like all of a sudden crockett has room to judge people he had an alligator (laughs) his hair is blow dried out come on (laughs) and then we go to the opening credits when we come back from the opening credits we're at caitlin's house so at least has a nice car to go pick her up and i guess he's got that right he had a nice outfit on Mm -hmm. (laughs) he has to flash the badge to get into the house too and the assistant angie is not about sunny at all she does not like sunny at all (laughs) oh yeah she wants to beat him down from the get-go angie by the way played by doris Tukey Smith. She was a model in the 70s and the 80s, appeared in all kinds of magazines like Vogue, Cosmopolitan. In the 80s, she moved into acting. She was on the TV show 227. And then in movies, uh, me and him. Yeah, 227. I have no idea what that show is, by the way. <laughs> it's, it's about these people that live in a neighborhood like in New York City in the block 227. And it's got it's just it was like a really popular show in the 80s sitcom is anyone doing a podcast about it (laughs) no i don't know maybe (laughs) must not have been that popular then (laughs) she was also in movies me and him i like it like that and the preacher's wife but what really caught my attention was she was in a long-term relationship for uh for many years with robert de niro and they actually have twin sons together born in 1995 really interesting when Caitlin finally comes out, Sunny tells her he's not excited about doing celebrity hand holding. She says, Yeah, you're also a little short. And you probably you only look the only gun you know you look like you know your way around is a blow dryer. Yeah. <laughs> he's so he's such a jerk right off the bat. He's like super rude. Like automatically, like, I don't want to be here. This is stupid. You don't need me. It's okay. He was an asshole. He's an asshole like this entire episode. Yeah, he is. And if it's not he, to yeah. her, it's <laughs> to <laughs> Angie is to the his, waiter, <laughs> waiter to his vice yes. team to tubs. <laughs> he literally leaves his duty to go pick up his son and bring him into harm's way. Yeah, like, that was the weirdest thing asshole. ever. Like you just met this lady, <laughs> yeah, and Billy and you don't have that also, great of a relationship. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> also, this scene was a stark reminder of how awful hair was in the eighties. You have Crockett with the mullet, and Sheena Easton's got, like, the Boy Meets World perm. (laughs) Yes. It's, like, shaved in the back and curly on top. (laughs) It was bad. That was very bad. Terrible. Meanwhile, Tommy is talking to his lawyer and saying, I don't want to go to jail. I'm not doing – and the lawyer's saying, you might only do six months. He's like, I don't care. I'm not doing any time. You talk to Gordon, and you tell him I'm not doing any time. He's got to get me some more money. That way I can pay my legal fees and get me out of this. Our lawyer, by the way, played by Raymond Joseph Teller. Yeah, that Teller from Penn and Teller. When I what? saw him in the, because I knew he was in this, I was looking at him. I was like, "That's him. really? That's him? He looks so different that with the mustache. Him? Yeah, it's him. No. See, you, you probably don't realize it because he's talking. <laughs> true. That is very true. So a few things. One. Did you know Taylor's 70 years old? Holy crap. Oh, my God. (laughs) Clearly, we didn't. Yeah. Yeah. That just blew my mind. Like, I wouldn't have guessed him out of his 50s, but okay. Raymond Joseph Teller, he legally changed his name to Just Teller. He's actually one of the few people that that actually was issued an American passport with a single name. And his start is actually pretty, pretty interesting, mostly because of some of the names of the groups he was in. So... Uh, he's originally from Philly. He graduated from Amherst College in ni- 1969 uh, with a Bachelor of Fine Arts. And he actually became a high school English and Latin teacher. So he was a high school teacher um, <laughs> for a while. I guess if you're 70, you had a chance to live an entire life before we even knew him. Yeah, exactly. He's had a whole <laughs> life before we knew he was yes. famous. <laughs> so while being an English teacher and a Latin teacher, he began performing with his friend Weir Chris Christmer under the name the Othmar Showick Society for the Preservation of Weird and Disgusting Music. <laughs> In 1974, they would meet Penn Gillette and they would become a three-person act called Asparagus Valley Cultural Society. 
<laughs> so in the 1981, they became a duo as Penn and Teller, and that's what they would be from then on. And uh, they would do a ton of HBO specials and Showtime specials. They would have a Showtime show called Penn and Teller Bullshit, and they would make appearances all over the place. And in fact, but like for Teller, he, he's only done a handful of actual appearances where he talks. And one of the few other appearances that he actually talks in was appearances on The Simpsons. So where he says, like, help me. Yeah. Right. That this where is he part of yeah. The yeah. <laughs> he's an author, as in he's written autobiography. He wrote an autobiography about his dad as one of his books. And he's even done some like stage directings. Interesting person. He's uh, also I, I encourage you to read up on him. He's also the master of incognito mode because Melissa didn't even know it was him. I didn't know it was him until you guys said it right now. Oh, no way. <laughs> no, I didn't know it just right now. Back over at Caitlin's, she's doing some light singing and then ready to take a break. And Sonny feels like he needs to come in there and harass her some more. <laughs> Sorry, that's a little bit later. What he's actually doing is he's cleaning his gun. Now, he's on protection duty, right? Yeah. And his gun's in 100 pieces in the living room. Yeah. <laughs> he takes protection serious, okay? <laughs> she needs to go out and go do some recording at the studio. So then they harass each other more in the car. They pull up to the studio, and then the engineer is giving her a hard time, too, saying she hasn't been able to sing in quite some time. She sounds like crap. And then Sonny actually steps in and defends her a little bit. Well, first, Sonny was trashing yeah. the song he was doing. And then the guy was like, "What? everyone has an opinion, you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Sonny was kind of saying, like, oh, she's covering Cher. Like, but what next? State fairs, you know? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Across town? different city i don't know we just all of a sudden jumped to this guy named gordon and he's talking to his assistant uh and that's he's in la i think mm. that's what that was. and this is the money behind tommy mm -hmm. and they're talking about him and uh they're first they're talking about his newest band that he's trying to promote they throw the tape out the window they're not even gonna listen to it his girlfriend <laughs> mm -hmm. and then they start to discuss him and they say look like gordon just says he can do his six month bit like i don't care Actually, the more important thing is, is that now no one know about our payola scheme that we have where people can pay for radio placement and get hits and stuff. So it's actually kind of important that him and Caitlin both just disappear. Yeah. And the conversation is kind of interesting, basically in a roundabout kind of old school, I guess, Hollywood gangster type way says uh, that if you won't do the time that he's just going to kill him. But in doing so, he also kind of tells the other guy that like, hey, if I go down, I'll rat you out. So which I thought was kind of funny. Down with <laughs> yeah, he said, yeah. I'll rat you out and you'll rat everybody else out. <laughs> Including the janitor. Yeah. <laughs> Poor janitor. He didn't do nothing. By the way, Gordon Wiggins, the character was played by Tony Hendra, was a famous British author and sat satirist. Uh, when he, he started uh, doing as a stand-up team with fellow comedian Nick Ulette, uh, Ulette, and they did appearances on Mer on the Merv Griffin show and the Ed Sullivan show. Actually, one of the original writers for National Lampoon, uh, including being their editor-in-chief until 1978. He was also in other movies, Jumping Jack Flash and, and This Is Spinal Tap, as well as co-creating, co-writing, and co-producing British satire show called Spitting Image, in which puppets were used in the Genesis video of Land of Confusion. He seems like someone that they actually kind of wasted by having on the show because he's barely in this episode and he's kind of a big deal. Yeah, I, I feel like there was a lot more there and it seems kind of weird that this is normally Vice's guy who played Bodyguard 1 and Cop Number 5 comes in and plays this role, you know? And then instead they have this guy who's actually... Like a big time writer, a big time comedian. You know, he's been around a bunch. Still, still over at Caitlin's, she's practicing. She gets a call from Max, like, "Hey, Max, no, everything's great. No, you're the best producer, and I'm the best singer." That like, it's just friends talking. But Sonny just barges his way into the conversation. It's like, "Oh, you're a little stuck up, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. You're the best singer ever." It's like, Sonny, man. Like, <laughs> yeah, he's like, "Who are you talking to? Who's Max?" And call the like, dogs off, bro. <laughs> yeah, she's like, um, a friend. Do you need to know everything? <laughs> to be fair, she, she did very loudly say, "Oh, he's from the fashion police on the phone." <laughs> oh, yeah, that's so. true. She was talking bad about him. <laughs> 
She's still not taking him seriously either. But everything she said up to this point has been true about Simon. True. I mean, he does like a blow dryer and he is wearing some very (laughs) high trendy clothing. She says at dinner, which is at the next scene, which is where they go off to because she wants to go out to dinner. And then she also wants to go by boat. Now, in between there, there's a really fast scene where Tommy and Benny are celebrating because they're out like bowling. I don't know. They couldn't skip league night for whatever reason while they're waiting to go to prison. Yeah. <laughs> well, only one of them going uh-huh. to prison. The other guy's not going to prison. Benny's okay. He's not. Well, no, he's and, got no problems. <laughs> hey, and Tommy is totally ru- ruining bowling night. Like all he wants to talk about is going to prison. Man, uh, <laughs> I, I'm telling you, this his buddies over here, you know, bowling the game of his life, and here's Tommy, blah blah blah, going to jail. This they won't pay. A, for that and then these three grease balls come walking in and tommy says benny you got to get lost i need to take care of some business get out of here and the business takes a literally 10 seconds for it to happen and you just hear the word accidente and then he pays them and then tommy goes back to bowling like benny didn't have to leave for that <laughs> yeah, didn't even do it in english <laughs> like <laughs> tommy was losing so tommy doesn't like to lose and so benny had to leave <laughs> So now we get to dinner. Caitlin wants to go out to dinner. That means Sonny has to go. She wants to go somewhere nice. He says pizza isn't junk food, but still they got to go somewhere nice. And she wants to go by boat. So they got to go in Sonny's boat. They got pulling up. And then Sonny just, he is a dick the entire time at dinner. And she's just making jokes at his expense. You know, but no, okay, let's not, let's be fair. She's basically saying that he's not a real cop. And look at him in his designer clothes and his fashionable car and everything. And she doesn't take him seriously. So they're both being dicks to each other. Like she's not, she has no idea that like he's a real cop. She acts like he's like just some bodyguard that's paid to watch her basically. And so yes. I, I did get a chuckle out of the waiter's comment, you know, basically saying like, hey, you horny yet? <laughs> yeah. um, but like, granted, oh, why the hell are they eating oysters? <laughs> That seems like asking for trouble for Sonny. <laughs> it's also went exactly the way I expected it to, where Sonny is a dick to the staff. <laughs> True. <laughs> well, maybe that waiter shouldn't be so nosy, okay? <laughs> and you're right, Melissa. She calls out Sonny, saying, like, you're not a real cop. And he says, hey, I'm just a regular guy making four twenty five a week. And I'm just... I'm renting these shoes. He's these still in that. <laughs> the, the shoes are from the also sure sonny you're just a regular guy who <laughs> yeah. also gets free designer clothes a porsche yep. a speedboat yep, exactly. and a well, yacht like, to live on but what he's saying is he doesn't own it it's just hit like that, yeah, i don't own anything he just gets to, the shoes. to use all of yeah, it you know true. gets to have all the high-end stuff without having to actually pay for it but he doesn't have any money he, he, he does Hey, to show it, for his job. <laughs> yeah can you imagine even your even his underwear is rented yeah, nothing is his. I mean, that's why Tubbs lives in his car. They don't make any money, okay? He even borrowed his haircut. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so when Sonny's done taking it personal and Caitlin gets up and leaves from the table because now she's mad at him, he goes out, goes to pay the bill, realizes that he doesn't have enough cash to pay for the bill. But luckily, the accident is going to happen here. Remember, <laughs> Tommy accident. wanted it to look like an accident. It looks just like an accident, yeah. except so, for a poor guy showing up to you with machine guns. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they really splurged on assassins. Like, I mean, could they hire more people with automatic weapons to shoot this chick? Also boats. Like, he paid for a boat. One person walks into the middle of the restaurant, kicks over a table and (laughs) fires at Caitlin. Another one on a boat from 13 miles away. He was in another, actually, another (laughs) continent. He thought he could get that. Cuba, actually. They they were surprised. They were still trying to park the boat. They heard the gunfire. Like, oh, God, we better shoot, too. Hang on, guys. We're parking. <laughs> Sonny shoots and kills the restaurant shooter. They jump in the boat. Luckily, the boat, the other boat was so far away that he was able to get his boat up to speed in a way. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> before the other boat like was able to ram him or cut him off luck? or anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he can't get away. But, so now they we're, catch up to him really fast. Now, so now we're in a boat chase, which is uh, Sonny's wheelhouse. So <laughs> we're, we're definitely starting to play toward Crockett's strengths here. It's not much of a strength in this case, though, because they are somehow able to shoot out the boat and make it stop, but without hitting anyone. And they're all just kind of standing up in the back of the boat in as easy targets. Yeah, I mean, she's not even laying down. Like when they're when they go take off, she's like just sitting in the boat like regular. <laughs> like, girl, have you never been shot at? Lay down. Like, get on the ground or something. <laughs> 
Crockett's on his knees, like driving the boat on his knees, and she's just sitting there like it's a regular cruise or something. <laughs> <laughs> this is all your fault. You wanted to take the boat. <laughs> boat comes to a stop. Sunny pops up, shoots the person who's got the automatic gun on the other boat, who smiles as he falls <laughs> into the water. That's really, yeah, it looks right at her. That's why she's all freaked out after. <laughs> the other guy just says, Screw this. It takes off. Like, that was great. Yeah. He's like, whatever. I didn't get paid for this. I'm leaving. Like, I feel like if he had just circled back, like this episode would have just been a hell of a lot shorter. <laughs> yeah, I know. And that's when Crockett died. <laughs> to this near so I, I love Crockett's bonds to this. So now the assassin's gone. And so Crockett, the first thing he does is he starts jiggling the keys, thinking like that's going to make the boat start. <laughs> and then, he starts complaining because this garden variety case resulted in assassins showing up. And it's like, did you even read the report, Crockett? <laughs> yeah, this is what you're here for. What did you think you were protecting her from? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, like it was a long night, near death experience. He had a shootout. The boat stuck. Okay, let's just shake it out. Let's calm down. It wouldn't be cool. Okay, tell me about what happened between you and Tommy. Like, oh, this guy Will that was also in the band. We had a lot of problems. He tried to sue Tommy, and then he showed up one day. Will was dead, and so now I always wanted to bring down Tommy. And Crockett's like, huh? Okay, you want a bone? You kind of want a bone. <laughs> hey, no, she really wanted a bone. Yeah, he's like, slow down, girl. Oh yeah. <laughs> this, this is like the cry. This is like the Crockett trifecta. Uh, he just saved her life. She's trapped on a boat with him, and she's all vulnerable. <laughs> like, he's practically unbuttoning his shirt as he's putting his gun away. Yeah, he's like, yeah. No. She does mention it at dinner, too. It's like, I better use that boat to get all kinds of women wet. Yeah, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they start kissing, and they start going away fast. He tells her to slow down. And Melissa, like, we've been down this road before with Sunny. <laughs> <laughs> he does this with everybody he's involved in. Like, haven't you learned your lesson? A hooker and a drug a drug addict were not enough for you. <laughs> so, of course, night ends. Next day, Coast Guard picks him up. Everything's fine. They're on the docks. <laughs> Crockett's like got his pants unbuttoned and his shirt totally open. <laughs> and she's wearing his jacket. Yeah. And yeah. Tubbs is like, oh, boy. <laughs> we all know what, what happened there. You went, you went and bowed oh, it, yeah. you? <laughs> so now they're going to have big heavy guards at the, and they're going to take her to the safe house not going to stay at her house anymore they escort her over there and Melissa Tufts' face in this whole thing is great too <laughs> yeah, he's like he knows exactly what's going on then they take her over there he's like shaking his head like hmm yeah I don't approve of this and then Crockett takes her up to the bedroom he's like this is going to be your room I'm going to be down the hall and like she grabs him and kisses him in the hallway and then I'm like watch Tubbs is going to walk up there Tubbs walks up and shakes his head like god damn it <laughs> this boy keep it in his pants <laughs> we all know okay <laughs> and Tubbs is the voice of reason tells Crockett like man you can't bang the witnesses like it's totally against protocol even Castillo's pissed yeah, even Castillo knows, and, he, and he's not happy about it either. <laughs> and then suddenly we fast forward to, like, that night, next day, is it a week? I, I don't know. We just also fast forward, and they're wearing yeah, it's like, different clothes, and it's nighttime. Yeah, so so Tubbs had, we're mad at him for boning her, but then he's left on the detail, you know, and all of a sudden we jump to a scene, like, excuse me, guys, I've got to protect her alone in the bathroom, possibly in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> Once in the hot tub, too. He also says he wants to make sure with her, like, you have to understand my life. I'm a police officer. I have these weird hours. I've, and also, like, my life before this. I've been married, divorced. I was as celibate as a monk. Huh. Hey, I don't know when that was. Hey, Sonny, <laughs> how about that madam you dated? <laughs> That's pretty celibate. <laughs> oh, 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 his celibate and I'm going to question it even more as we get toward the end of this episode, but I'll bring that up in a little bit. And Caitlin says she doesn't care. He says, I got a kid. She says, what flavor? <laughs> okay, now I'm worried she's going to eat him. And she also wants to meet little Greggy. Or <laughs> Jimmy. Stevie. Dude, no, Billy, Billy, Billy. That's all right. So this is where it's, things get a little weird. She's a protected <laughs> witness and we're going to meet little Danny. And so the very next scene She's in the recording booth with a bunch of kids. And I'm thinking like, like, what is this? Like Danny and all of his classmates. And then I'm like, I don't even think Crockett's kid's here. And turns out, no, Crockett's kid's not even there. Like, like we get this random scene with her recording with kids. And then we jump to uh, the next scene with Tommy. And it's not till like a few scenes later until Crockett can get visitation rights, I guess. 
<laughs> I have I have a hard time believing that he could just pop right into his kid's life after being gone for like three years, and that Catherine or whatever her name is Caroline is like, yeah, you know what? You can take him for a couple of days. He can miss school, so he can she can meet go your ahead. new girlfriend you just met. Yeah, go ahead and take him to see your new girlfriend at the safe house. Yeah, what? Because you know that went so yeah. well the last time yeah. I sent. Yeah, exactly. Him, last time I sent Timmy with you but, to a safe house. Yeah, <laughs> went so we almost well. died. <laughs> Stepdad Bob must have been out of town because he Bob would have never let happen. He would have never <laughs> let this fly. But don't worry, because ever since he she married Bob, she's been really loosened up. So that's what that's what Billy. She's been said. a lot happier. Yeah, and, things have been Crockett's great like, since since Bob's been around. Bob's yeah, really Crockett's brought structure to that like, household. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite part at the studio where she's singing, where both Sonny and the engineer and Caitlin are all like, "Yeah, she sounds great now." Like, see what a little bit of sex does. <laughs> all she needed was one night of it. No. Did anyone else not think that that whole song sounded terrible, or was that just me? Uh, it sounds like a Sheena Easton song. Which oh, is no. terrible. <laughs> sounded all right. I thought the kids sounded terrible. I'm like, kids are the worst part. No, <laughs> we have a fast stop over where we're going to see Tommy die, where he gets a explosive cassette tape and he puts it in his car. He's heavy like, metal. this must be heavy metal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then he puts it in the tape deck and it blows up his Porsche. How did they rig it so that the, the cassette tape would blow it up? And what if he just could he have, like driven around for like three days? Uh, Not if put he, it like, in. <laughs> yeah, just listening to the radio. <laughs> what if he put it in his Walkman? Well, there you go. Like take out some people on the bike path? <laughs> yeah, they don't care. <laughs> uh -oh. And so now we get to the scene that you guys are talking about. I know I'm kind of breezing over Tom Tommy's death, but no one cares. Nah. Sonny picks up little Billy and says that his mom's been a lot better since Papa Bob moved in. We know that's true. We just talked about that. And mm -hmm. Timmy just wants his dad to be happy, though. He's like, I just, you know, Dad, I'm happy that I'm going to go hang out with you. Let's get what this co this co conversation Isn't that is. that sad, though? He's like, I just want to hang out with you. I don't care if I have to go meet your bimbo to do it. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> so he brings his son over to meet his protected witness. It's almost so that it's almost like so they can play house for a little bit. Yeah, and then he just disappears. Did you notice that about that? Like he brings her over, he he meets her, and then like he's never seen again until the wedding. <laughs> like, where's Billy? Yeah, <laughs> they brought him so that yeah. Gina could watch him. <laughs> oh, ouch! <laughs> <laughs> ouch. Well, salt we, on the wound. See, Crockett hangs around long enough to tell Sheena that since. Tommy blew blowed up. His assignment's over. So bye, Felicia. <laughs> <laughs> Real fun playing with you, but I gotta go. <laughs> I'll always remember the boat because <laughs> it was only like we only had two days together. And then we have and, and then we get this little awkward. He gives that little awkward dance where where he tries to ask her to be buddies, and then uh, either being buddies or he's trying to ask her to go steady with him. I just. I couldn't figure. He's actually, and this is what's weird, is that it's hard as much time has passed. Because in the very beginning of the episode, he says he's he doesn't want to watch her. He doesn't want to do this assignment. And, he's, and she says, relax, it's only for a week. And then at some other point in time, it changes from a week to a month. Yeah, Castillo says it's for a week in the beginning, too. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. So now I don't. I have no idea how much time has actually passed. I think now. it's supposed to be a week. I think that that's what's supposed to be. But see, I think it's, I don't know. I can't tell because then it got turned into a month. It could have been, I don't know. That's what's really hard to pinpoint here is how fast did Sunny go from I hate you to, let's, to actual wedding, not we should get married, to the actual wedding. Yeah, not which like I'm going to get married. It's with. not going to happen. We're not, not, it's not actually going to go through. But. So, and this is when Sonny starts to go on his little tour of telling all of his friends about that he's getting married. He pulls into the precinct. He's late again, interrupts a meeting again, again pulls <laughs> Gina out of it to tell her that he's getting married. She's like, I don't care. Oh, she cares. <laughs> oh, no. But, oh, no. Oh, no. She That's, very much cares. <laughs> so I was gonna. What I was gonna bring up when he did his little oh, and I've been celibate for so long. Then why is he pulling Gina aside in the locker room and breaking it to her like he was just boning her last week? Yeah. Uh, like, why did hey, she act baby, like? Hey, baby, we can't. We, we can't do that. We've been doing. You see, I upgraded. I got me a pop star. 
<laughs> yeah, it's clear it's meant to be like that he never called it off with Gina. He never really called it off with Gina. So are they been doing stuff on the side we don't know about? Yeah, that definitely hints at that they're more off and on than what we see in the show. Yeah, because she's definitely upset. She's like, mm-hmm. whatever. You have to I don't you don't have to need my permission. Okay, but she's clearly visibly upset. Yeah, like she was still making stops to the boat all the way up until uh she's eating Elvis. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then he talks to Tubbs. He really, really wants Tubbs to be cool with this. He pitches hard to Tubbs that he needs that he wants Tubbs, to get married. And Tubbs really doesn't want to uh, <laughs> let him down. But Tubbs kind of sees the future in that Cock is probably going to get her killed somehow. Just <laughs> with the history of the show, somehow Crockett's going to be responsible for this woman's death. <laughs> so I think maybe he read ahead in the script. <laughs> But you forgot the best part I, when, you he, know, when he told Castillo, and Castillo was so happy, he smiled. He gives him that trip to New Zealand, yeah, like, like, please go to this other country and never like come back. New Zealand? How do they get the money <laughs> Never <that>? come back. <laughs> yeah. My life has been hell with you here. Yeah. You don't, you don't follow any rules. Yeah. You're terrible at your expense harder. reports. I have to get this expensive uh, stuff for you. Like, Meanwhile, back at, are, are they still, is she still at the hide house? The, the, yeah, she's still at the protected house, I think. She is. Okay. Because, I, I mean, so. we have no sense of time here. <laughs> or anything so, else. But yeah. <laughs> so back, I think in protection, and she's kind of doing the exact opposite. She's like, girl, he's a loser. You could do so much better than him. Why are you going to marry this man? She and- says he's dangerous. Like, it's a dangerous job. Do you understand he, how dangerous it is for him? He to gets caught? almost everyone he's involved with murdered. It's dangerous. It's a yeah. dangerous job. <laughs> Why didn't you listen, Caitlin? <laughs> I'm also starting to question if this is still Miami Vice or if we switched over to Miami's Creek. <laughs> <laughs> one life to Miami. No, <laughs> so, so, so we go from there back to the precinct where they're basically throwing Sonny a uh, congratulations. Like they're they're throwing him like an impromptu bachelor party, which I'd have to imagine that Vice probably gets the best strippers. So I was, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. They know the best ones on already. Uh-huh. Also, Tubbs doing toasts with orange juice. Um, okay, was that orange juice or was that carrot juice? I'm pretty sure that's carrot juice. <laughs> we were the whole time. I was like, I, what is he drinking? You know what? That makes more sense because people can spike your orange juice. <laughs> carrot juice is the safer option. <laughs> Ain't no one touching your carrot juice. <laughs> but everyone's Gina. really happy that Sonny's banging up prop star. It's like they, congratulations. Like, none of us ever thought you would do this good. I really think it's because he married into money. And so now he's going to leave. <laughs> They're all like, happy. <laughs> It's like they were throwing him a going away party. <laughs> exactly. Because he's like, oh, how did you find these people? I he's, haven't seen these people yes. in ten years. Where did he's you find them? He's marrying money, and they're saying goodbye. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yes. Even Castillo got up and did a speech and everything. It ends in complete vice fashion with a wedding montage that involves a guitar. Which I'm pretty sure that's Jan Hammer playing. It is. The yep, it is Jan Hammer. I fully expected Dad to give Crockett away at the wedding, <laughs> which I think we got. I also think it's a crime that Crockett was wearing white. Come on, you're not fooling anyone, Crockett. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a fast scene in there where Gordon says they still need to take care of the Caitlin thing. And then we go to the wedding and there's all this stuff with the with the wedding. And then freeze frame and the episode's over. Like literally, like we end at the wedding. That's it. And it was like a montage of the wedding, not even like them talking. You couldn't even hear what they were saying. Like Billy was yawning. <laughs> Tubbs is looking skeptical. <laughs> They're talking to each other. And her dad or whoever walked around the aisle was like, what am I doing here? <laughs> the, yeah, this is uh, uh, uh. this is the end of the episode. This it we we switched where we are competing with Dallas and we we're gonna compete with it with a police show to the second half of this episode was a Dallas episode. Someone's getting married and they're marrying see, for money and some people approve, some people disprove. Okay, and, it can't be Dallas unless someone gets drugged, raped, and then pregnant on the episode. Almost there. We're almost there. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to say is like, this must have been when Dallas shot someone. And so Vice <laughs> was like, well, if you're going to do our thing, then we're going to do your thing. <laughs> maybe that's when, maybe we need to look up when JR got shot because that, that would be. This episode took such a weird turn i understand this is setting things up for like a three episode arc then there's a gap and then there's um deliver us from evil uh which is almost at the end of the season yeah, so yeah. this is there's still a ways to go because deliver us from evil is part of the um sunny burnett arc yep so we still got a ways to go to deal with sheena easton 
and this wedding, but it's what show are we watching from <laughs> Missing Hours to this and the one that was before Missing Hours, which we raved about, mm -hmm. about how great that episode was. What is happening to Miami Vice? I am scared and angry. <laughs> <laughs> and confused. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get to the final thoughts, because I have many on this. I have the many. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go talk about this music and learn about Sheena Easton. Because I have to admit, I know nothing about her. That when I saw her, I'm like, that's Sheena Easton? <laughs> 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 All right, John, this is pretty straightforward. We have two bands, one in the beginning, and then Sheena Easton. What do you got for us this week? Yeah, so let, let's go ahead and get the one in the beginning out of the way. That is MCs of Rap's Domination. That's the song. So MCs of Rap was a group that spawned out of Miami's bass music scene in the late 80s, early 90s. One of several rap groups that spawned out of there with the help of rapper Luke Skywalker. <laughs> From, Perfect. Uh... Is it Luke Skywalker from Star, oh, Star Wars? From Two oh, Live Crew. Two Live Crew. Oh, okay. yeah, he's from like, Two Live Crew. Yeah, he's oh, like really? Yeah, I'm yes. like looking at you like. Did you not know that was his name? No, I didn't know that was his name. <laughs> I, I was. That's why I paused for a minute. I was going to let you guys amongst each other because I figured no one would know who Luke Skywalker <laughs> I, the rapper I knew who was. He was. <laughs> Luke Skywalker the rapper, also owner of Sky uh, Skywalker Records at the time. He was producing rap groups and one of the raps. He he signed was two live crew out of California. He and then he would join suit with them as their producer and pretty much hype man on uh, uh, sh showing up on the records, including eighty six is nasty as they want to be with eighty uh, nines. Luther Kimball's, aka Luke Skywalker's record studio, would go bankrupt in the nineties after he would be sued by George Lucas for using the name Luke Skywalker. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Who saw that coming? Yeah. So now I could sit and I could talk more about Two Live Crew, but they're not actually the ones who did the song. MCs of Rap did the song. MCs of Rap members included Calvin Pete, aka Cool CP, Don Saunders, aka Dandy D, and Raymond Cox, aka DJ Cox or Cut Master Cox. <laughs> <laughs> they actually disbanded in 1990. They released two albums, Ain't No Stopping Us Now and Gotta Be Funky, and, but they really never really got a whole lot of fame. Now, other people coming out of that Miami bass scene would eventually become famous. At the height of the Miami bass scene, you, uh, it would produce artists such as 95 South, Tag Team, 69 Boys, and the Quad City DJs. You know... All those those really big <laughs> names, right, guys? Yeah. Okay. All right. So like you may not recognize the name of the names of the people, but you'll probably recognize the names of their songs. We yeah, have ninety threes. Whoop! There I it is. I, I was gonna say, like, I think I could string them all together into a single sentence. Like, whoop! There it is. Someone let the dogs out. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to remember the last there's one more song I'm blanking out on. It was whoop, there it is. Whoop, there it is. So there was two different ones, almost <laughs> identically named. There was Tootsie Roll, my I favorite, say, 94. <laughs> uh, yeah, by the 69 boys. Let me see your Tootsie Roll. <laughs> um, and then Come On and Ride It, The Train by the Quad City D DJs. So there uh, actually some hits did come out in the early 90s from the Miami bass scene. So now let's shift focus and let's talk about Sheena Shirley Easton, who plays Caitlin Davies in the show, but also gave us I Got You, Babe, the share cover and When He Shines in the show. She's a S Scottish singer, songwriter and actress. Now, John, before you continue on, I have to say, I, I have no idea who Sheena Easton was. I recognize the name, but I didn't know. I have no idea who she was. And in my head, I pictured, based on the name, a Paula Abdul-like person. <laughs> and then I saw Sheena Easton and saw that she was from Scotland. And I was, I was surprised, to say the least. Now, in my head, I still picture Paula Abdul. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to be completely honest with you. I did not. I had heard the name Sheena Easton, but I did not know anything about Sheena Easton either. And I went into this thinking that she was some kind of country singer. And then I find <laughs> out that she's Scottish. I realized I was way off. <laughs> So I'm in the same boat as you. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> well, I knew who yes. she was, and I didn't like her music. So there. No, <laughs> <laughs> I knew who she was. She sounds like shit. <laughs> much <laughs> <laughs> so guys sheena easton is like the first reality tv star like the original the first one <laughs> she first came into the public eye on the first british music reality tv show ever the big time dot up singer which recorded her attempts to gain a record contract over the course of a year interesting and i know that they've had yeah. there's a there's a music competition has been on TV for decades. It's in Europe. I forget what it's called, like the Star or something oh, like yeah, that. Oh no, yeah, everyone watches it. Yeah, yeah, like Euro big, Star or something. Yeah, like that. and but this is interesting that this was just about her. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, and this is like 1980 when when she was on here, like 79, 80. So like this is like the first one, and then she wouldn't get a record contract while she was on the show. It wouldn't be till after show she would get picked up by EMI. She gets a record contract after the show, and she records her first hits, "Modern Girl" and "Money Train." And they they charted so well, and their career just took off. And she would also have a top ten hit in both the U.S. and U.K. in '81 with a the James Bond theme for your eyes only, but actually also win her a Grammy, her first Grammy for best new artist. But by the end of 1982, sales start slumping. She would actually be one of the first people to record what would become eventually a uh, Bette Midler hit, the song Wind Beneath My Wings. Hmm, interesting. In 1984, she would go a little bit more sexy dance siren than pop star, and her success would fade away in the UK, but it would continue in the US. And she would actually become one of the first artists to have her music video banned because of the lyrics for the song Sugar Walls. Sugar hmm. Walls was said to have been written by Prince under the pseudonym Alexander Nevermind. That is the perfect pseudonym for something that Prince would come up exactly. with. Exactly. Like, Prince, we don't think you should put your actual name on this. Well, fine then. Never mind. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Never mind. So, and so if that's not crazy enough, sometimes we find connections in our music. Well, this has a connection to two live because. That would put her on Tipper Gore's list of the Filthy 15 as head of the PMRC. It was basically Tipper Gore was spearheading the parental advisory. One of the Filthy 15, Sheena Easton's Sugar Walls, also one of the Filthy 15, pretty much anything Two Live Crew ever did. Yeah, they, there's nothing safe from Two Live Crew. I'm pretty sure they just wrote Two Live Crew on there. <laughs> so, but that song Sugar Walls would actually get her to number three on the R&B charts and number nine on the Hot 100, and it would not be the end of her working with Prince. In 87, she would do sing a duet with Prince called You Got the Look, which would score her some Grammy nominations and get up to number two on the charts. And then she would also do a duet for 89's Batman soundtrack with Prince. So hanging out with, with the legend. <laughs> Wow. I think they dated. I think they dated for a while yeah, or something. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I'm pretty Prince hit that. By her Vice appearance, once again, popularity was kind of middling. So Vice actually spiked her popularity quite a bit. She kept her going until about 91 when her album What Comes Naturally came out. And that would actually be her last album to chart in the U.S. That doesn't mean that she has stopped working. She actually, she's still putting stuff out. Coming to, this to day, the Merced but... County Fair this summer. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yes, yes. But this is where her, her work would kind of change. And part of that is because in 95 and, and, in, and then again in 96, she would adopt kids. And so she would kind of only work part time after that. She also started doing a lot of work for cartoons. She'd provide songs for All Dogs Go to Heaven 2. Also, the All Dogs Go to Heaven TV show and Christmas special. Fern Goldie, The Last Rainforest, and the movie Shiloh, which is about a dog. And so it's another kid's movie. Another Vice Connection Alert. Um, she also voiced several characters on the animated show Gargoyles. Weird. Oh. There's lots of tie-ins together here. <laughs> yeah. In 92, I just want to mention, in 92, she actually acted on Broadway uh, opposite Raul Julia in what would be Raul Julia's last stage appearance in the Broadway play Man of La Mancha. Hmm. Um, She's got more range than I am 
anticipating like what she's involved with. Yeah. Um, I expected mm-hmm. her to be a pop eighties hit, and then by the early nineties, she'd be done and on with her life. And but no, she's been she's very di- diversified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She even provided voice for the character of Anna of the Shadows for the P- PC game Planescape tournament she currently resides in vegas her kids are grown and uh she has survived four marriages but just barely (laughs) barely (laughs) and there's your music well let's i knew we we, we were coming into some stuff with sheena easton because i didn't know anything about her and also knew she's kind of big time so there's gonna be lots of stuff that was gonna involve involve with her um and i don't think for a minute we're done with sheena easton facts john i think you're sitting on some because you know she's gonna appear three more times now be holding out she's gonna she's (laughs) gonna she's gonna continue to appear and so there are certain things that were left out because i need something to talk about later All right, let's go give our final thoughts on the episode and see if we can piece together what the hell's happening with Miami Vice. All right, I'm kicking off this week. I ended last week with a major conspiracy theory and Vice's involvement with the Illuminati behind the scenes with Unsolved Mysteries, the two tied together. All right, all right, so that's where I'm at. That's where we left last week. Now let's go back in time. Go back two weeks. Go to God's Work is an amazing episode of Miami Vice, reminiscent of season one and two. We have serious, we have some comedy. It's a very thought out storyline. But it's way good, it's way balanced and involves almost everyone from the Vice team. Then we go to Missing Hours. Now they needed the episode they made Missing Hours. And so that means it had to go somewhere. It's just unfortunate it took place right after God's work. They just had to find somewhere for it. There's two big story arcs that happened in this season. Okay, I'm let down with Missing Hours and where the show is going, what they decided to do with that. And then here comes Like a Hurricane. This episode takes such a stark turn by the time we get about half to two-thirds of the way through the episode. Like, it turns into a soap opera. And I cannot believe that it ends. It just ends with the wedding. And do this little hint. Like, we got to take care of this. Caitlin deal. I thought for sure there was going to be a shooting at the wedding. Not that anyone's going to die because I know that Sheena Easton's going to be around for a while. But there's still, you know, Vice is staying up. But the closest we got to Vice in it up was putting Jan Hammer in the wedding. So, which we've already done before. <laughs> so, hey, you leave him alone. Yes. You wanted to jam. <laughs> and you're right. It's a full wedding treatment. Like, saying the vows, putting on the rings, close up of Freddie. They're child (laughs) what the shit miami vice what the hell is happening over there someone dick wolf must be off making another show and he's the producer on this but he's not actually paying attention someone needs to call dick have him come over and check in on the writing crew he needs to make them an offer they can't refuse (laughs) and get their shit back on track i don't know what is happening here guys (laughs) This writing room. All right, everyone, listen. Sit down. Shut up and sit and and just sit down and listen for a minute. Okay, you guys have been messing around in here, coming up with some new wild ideas, yeah. trying to compete with what's on prime time in the '80s. Go back to being Miami Vice. All right. Yeah. If not, heads are gonna roll. I mean, <laughs> by heads rolling, I mean all of you will continue to be on the rest of the season and also be more involved with teleplays and the storyboard <laughs> editors throughout the rest of the season. And that's where my frustration comes in is knowing that as someone who's never seen Miami Vice before and now going through se- season four for the first time and I see the names for the writers and directors and it says that they're coming back later in the season. This isn't going away. This is our new reality. This is the new Miami Vice. Whether you're ready for it or not, we're going to end episodes in a wedding. <laughs> John, what are your final thoughts? <laughs> okay, Vice, you got me. I have no idea where the hell you're going with this. One, what is the interest all of a sudden with little Dougie? Why did we have to dig? <laughs> little Dougie's doing fine with Papa Bob and, and Crockett's ex-wife. Like, why did we have to keep dragging him into this? It's almost like like the show's try, trying to prove that, you know, Sonny's not a terrible father. Like, like, we're past that, Vice. We've ignored him for two full seasons. <laughs> Don't start trying to play good dad now. The strangeness, dope opera ness the lack of shootouts and vice of the episode. Now that I actually know more about Sheena Easton, I'm like, okay, I can get behind this. I can get behind Sheena Easton. I can see she's kind of like, you know, that it pop star of the time. But where are you going? Where are you going, Vice? Where are you going with this? I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> are things, are we going more toward missing 
missing hours UFO style stuff, or are we gonna get more wedding montages? Is there gonna be like a a, a baby shower up next episode, or are we gonna get back to hookers and drugs? Because that's worst... kind of what I like about Vice. The worst part about it is that we started the episode with like great Vice stories, like someone's trying to buy rocket launchers and Uzis. Yeah, and we're like, like go no, back to that. Go, go babysit this pop star that you're gonna marry. You're like, wait. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, I want to hear the story about the 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 rocket launchers. I want to see Sonny's car get blown up. And what are we going to do about the porn viewer that did arrest last week <laughs> that's still out there? <laughs> well, to wrap up my final thoughts, at least we got some very strange crossovers with Gargoyles, the animated show, and Tipper Gore. <laughs> um, like, can't get more random than that, guys. <laughs> Melissa, what are your final thoughts? Well, as somebody who has seen what happens, I know the future. <laughs> I know what happens with everything. I don't like these. I don't like this episode. <laughs> I never liked the storyline. It never made any sense to me that he needed to rush in. I don't understand the the need to rush the wedding. Why not like move in together? Why did because they why was it because he needed to stop protecting her? That did that mean he had to stop seeing her altogether? Why couldn't he just date her? What was the need to have them be married? They could have moved in together. She could have lived on the boat with him. I mean, she's rich. She's got a house. He could park his boat over there. They could have bought a boat together. (laughs) Yeah. I just don't understand why they needed to get married. And even, like, I get it, okay? I know she's going to be in the next three episodes. And I know that it's a big story arc and everything. But I still don't think, I still don't think it needed to be that fast. I think you could have done it in like two episodes or something. Stretch it out for God's sakes. I'm not, I'm just going to say it right now. She ruins the storylines because all the next storylines that she's in, it's because she's like super jealous and she can't handle his job, which is what Tubbs was trying to tell him. You know, like, are you sure you want to do this because you have this job or you don't come home at night? (laughs) Oh no, she understands. She's so, you know, but she's like really insecure and you know, why are you coming home? And it ruins it. It just ruins it. And nothing is about Vice, about their relationship. And Tubbs is like a mediator for them. I predict we won't see any more of Angie. That that's Now that they're married, the first thing Crockett's going to put his foot down is you're going to fire that bodyguard, <laughs> Angie. Bodyguard? <laughs> Her friend. You're fired as a friend. John, and I know Melissa already knows the future, but John, we're going into this blind. I'm going to give you something to look forward to because we've had two rough weeks in a row here. Next week, it's a Castillo episode that involves the Yakuza. It's so a good, good one. Fingers crossed. Ooh. Next week we're coming back. Dad's gonna have to fight with someone who tries to swallow their own tongue again. <laughs> it's a good episode. I like this yes. episode. <laughs> Ninja Vice. <laughs> <laughs> and that's going to do it for us this week we hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat as always we would love to hear from you email us gowiththeheat at gmail.com tweet at us at go with the heat. get us on Instagram go with the heat on Instagram Facebook facebook.com slash go with the heat you can find us all of those places we've had quite the debate on Twitter of people relating to our opinions about missing hours <laughs> so you like to join us, come hang out with us on Twitter at Go With The Heat. Get us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Go With The Heat. Email go with the heat at gmail.com. Be sure to review the show. That would be amazing, fantastic. We would love you. You would be our best pals ever. Please go review the show on your podcast platform of choice, preferably iTunes. Just if I if I have to pick one, please go review us on iTunes. That's kind of the catch-all for them that, that would perform the best is on iTunes. But, you know, you do. You do you. Wherever you get your podcasts, you listen to them on some other app I'm not mentioning, please review us there. That would be a big help. Second way you can help us, email goldtheheat at gmail.com. Third way, check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash goldtheheat. See what other things we want to make before the Miami Vice run is over and we start to evaluate what the next show we're going to do. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals.